Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Kingston Writers Fest. My name is Ara McCauley. I'm the artistic director of the festival, and I'm pleased to present The Long Shadow of War. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which the festival customarily takes place and where I am situated today is the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. We gratefully acknowledge these Indigenous nations for their ongoing guardianship of this land. We agree to peaceably share in responsibility and stewardship of this land, its waters, and all of its biodiversity. All those who come to live and work here are responsible for honoring these relationships in a spirit of peace, friendship, and respect. I'd like to thank the Canada Council, Canadian Heritage, Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Kingston and Kingston Arts Council for their ongoing support of the festival. We're grateful to all the organizations and individuals who support us. For this event, I would especially like to thank Connie Corbett in memory of Beatrice Margaret Grant Blackstock Corbett, author patron of Eric Friesen, and Lynn Kenny and Virginia Gordon, author patrons for Guy Vanderhaeg. This event is an hour long and includes a question and answer period. You're welcome to type your questions into the Q&A box, which is located at the bottom of your screen anytime during the event. As a thank you for, to you for continuing to support Kingston Writers Fest and joining us for the virtual edition of the festival, we will randomly select a pre-registered participant of this event following our Q&A to win a copy of the book. We are doing this for each onstage event throughout the festival. Now I'm delighted to introduce this event's presenter, Eric Friesen. Eric is a broadcaster, writer, and speaker on music, culture, and faith in both Canada and the United States. He was a network host and executive for both CBC Radio and Minnesota Public Radio, NPR. For CBC, he hosted such programs as Studio Sparks, on stage at Glenn Gould Studio and in performance, as well as a celebrated documentary series, The Concerto According to Pincus and The Concerto According to Manny. Eric was the founding program director for Winnipeg's new classical and jazz station, Classic 107, and is a consultant to the Radio <coughs> New Zealand's concert network. He also continues to serve a wide variety of major cultural orga organizations nationally and internationally, teaches at Victoria College University, Toronto, and co-hosts a book club in the maximum unit of Collins Bay Prison and Institution in Kingston. Please welcome a former chair of the board and friend of the festival, Eric Friesen. Thank you so much, Ara, and uh, congratulations to you and all your staff for keeping these writers' fests going during this uh, challenging time. Uh, my joy to be here and especially to introduce and welcome to Kingston Writers Fest, the novelist, short story writer, and playwright, Guy Vanderhaeg, who has a new novel called August Into Winter. Many of you know that he has three times been winner of the Governor General's Award for Fiction. He's won a host of international and national awards. The one I like particularly is 2004. He won his book, uh, The Last Crossing Won Canada Reads, when Jim Cuddy championed it. And he beat out, let's see, Tom King, Alice Monroe, Monique Pru, and Mordecai Richler, no less. So his bibliography now, six novels, four short story collections, and uh, two plays. Many of you know his trilogy of novels, uh, The Englishman's Boy, uh, The Last Crossing, and The Good Man, and, um, and uh, terrific novels they are, and we've got a new one now to talk about. He's received the Saskatchewan Order of Merit, He's received the Saskatchewan Lieutenant Governor's Lifetime Achievement Award, and he is an officer of the Order of Canada. Guy was born and raised in Saskatchewan, still lives there, his life and work deeply interwoven with that province. So now 10 years after his last novel, we have this new one, August and the Winter, set mostly in Saskatchewan, but Guy has moved out of the 19th century into the 20th, and particularly into the year 1939, when the Spanish Civil War is uh, coming to a close, World War II is on the horizon. It's a, it's a thriller, it's a story of evil, it's a love story, international politics is involved, the shadow of war, of course, as we've heard, and some, some redemption as well, and always with Guy's sense of dark humor. And, and I have to say, with another splendid cast of Van der Haag characters who live out their drama in the soil of southeastern Saskatchewan. Guy is joining us today from his home in Saskatoon. So Guy Vanderhaeg, welcome to Writers Fest. Thank you very much. It's a great delight to be here. 
So I'll have you read a little bit from the new novel in just a moment, but uh, a couple of questions first. You're a writer of historical fiction. So why the year 1939 when you decided to come back, come to the 20th century? Um, I think because it, it's a huge transition point in the 20th century, particularly after uh, 10 years of depression and drought, if you were living in Saskatchewan, uh, extraordinary, extraordinarily difficult economic times, and also extraordinarily difficult economic times. Um, the world is going to be changed by a global war, uh, a war of even greater extent than the First World War was. And in some ways, the world we live in now is going to come out of that. So those were the, the, the things that intrigued me. And one other thing I'll add is that the novel is dedicated to my parents. And one of the things that, that I've always felt very deeply is how difficult their early lives had been. Um, 10 years of, of, of depression, um, six years of war, and how my generation had, had more or less escaped scot-free. When I was coming to the end of this novel, one of the questions I was asking myself is how did they manage to endure that? Uh, how did they continue on through all of those difficult times? And then suddenly I felt, I faced as everybody uh, has faced, probably the biggest crisis of my time, which was the COVID pandemic. Um, given my age, it, it, it means that it came relatively late, but I think it is going to be the event that virtually everyone who is alive now, whether, whether they're, they're a child or, or you know, a young person, young adult, or even someone my age, it's going to in some ways be a defining event. So I didn't escape scot-free, <laughs> the, 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 the sort of uh, um, expansive trauma that, that comes with, with either, you know, a, a huge war or economic depression, or in this case, a pandemic. So endurance is a kind of theme, one of the themes of this novel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one of the things is that in the conclusion of the novel, um, man called Oliver Dill and the woman that he's um, in love with, uh, who are being pursued by a psychopath, are walking through a Saskatchewan blizzard. Um, and what he keeps on urging her is to put one foot in front of the other which for me in some ways is a, is a definition of endurance. And, and also in the novel, there's a passage in, in, in which he asks the question, how, how are all of these people keeping going? Um, there are reports coming up by, by this time in the novel, reports coming out of Poland about what's happening there, um, the, the, the growing menace of the war. And his conclusion is the only thing that keeps people going is love, and that that may be love for children or family, um, the love between lovers. But but for him, uh, he he he's saying to himself that this this is the thing that keeps us going. So along with the dedication to your parents, this novel is very much set in your home territory, right? So right. Sort of what north of the Capel Valley up to Yorkton, sort of in that area. Hey, 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 this is your very good geography. Yes, yeah, that's exact. I'm that's a prairie exact, boy, so yeah. No, yeah. that's that's roughly the 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 location. I have a, a fictionalized Saskatchewan town that has appeared in one other novel and occasionally in short stories called Connet, Saskatchewan, which is modeled roughly in terms of geography and lands, landscape on my hometown, Esterhazy, Saskatchewan. Now, since I fictionalized this town, it gives me a little bit more leeway in terms of, of, of adjusting according to the requirements of the novel, but that's the geography. Right. Okay, I think it's time we hear you read something from it. What have you chosen, Guy? I'm going to read a very short passage in which um, uh, the reader's introduced to one of the principal characters in the novel. His name's Oliver Dill. Um, he's a First World War veteran who carries the trauma of that war 
Uh, he's also a widower um, and he's, he's found himself um, in, a, in a sense moved into an incredibly solitary existence. So I'm just gonna read a short, short passage that introduced him. The one other thing I'll say is that there's a murder that occurs in the town on the day that a huge storm breaks. And it, Oliver Dill is, um, is on his, his farm on this day. He was christened Oliver Dill, but as soon as he began to walk, his father gave him the nickname Jumper because the kid had a habit of leaping before he looked. Peter Dill used to say of him, there's my boy, Jumper Dill, diving headfirst into the rocks again. He pretended to disapprove of his son's reckless ways, but secretly he was pleased. Nevertheless, his pleasure in the jumper's devil may care attitude diminished when Oliver's older brother Jack enlisted in 1916, and Oliver immediately followed suit, trooped off to war after Jack like he was the Pied Piper. Oliver Dill had always been stubborn, frequently kept to an intention whether it was wise or not. The morning of August 16th was a case in point. He had set that day aside to butcher a heifer. When he stepped outside and felt the full force of the heat and humidity, the sensible thing would have been to leave messing about in blood and gore for a cooler day, but Dill went ahead with the job anyway. By noon, he had finished skinning and gutting the animal. All that was left to do was to cut the carcass into quarters and haul them to the ice house. But time was running short. A big storm was brewing, getting ready to break. Dill watched the clouds rolling down from the north. They made him think of a mine disaster movie he'd seen years before, the tremendous explosion that had driven a burst of black smoke out of the mouth of the mine shaft and sent it swarming over the ground until the screen itself was swallowed up in sinister, writhing darkness. This was the kind of darkness advancing on him now. Thunder detonated with dull booms, flickers of blue-yellow chain lightning played hopscotch along the horizon. The morning was dying. It was just short of midday, and it had already gone twilight dark. The temperature was dropping, the sweat on his back congealing like grease in a cooling fry pan. A breath of rain whispered a few cold words against his neck. The air curdled, turned deadly still. Then a blast of wind gave a sharp whistle, nearly blew him off his feet, sent him ducking and dodging shingles ripped from the roof of a nearby granary that were swooping around his head like agitated bats shaken from their roost. A burst of rain drenched his clothes, molded them to his body like a second sad skin. Big drops pelted his eyes, half blinding him. But even half blinded, he caught a glimpse of his wife, Judith, standing on the back step of the big farmhouse, half hidden in a swirl of white smoky rain. She was looking for him, peering desperately into the downpour. Suddenly the wind died, the rain slackened, and in this window of stillness, he recognized that the dress Judas was wearing was the one that had caught his eye in that Calgary candy shop so many years ago a butter-colored summer frock sprinkled with tiny black polka dots. Then he saw that the eyes seeking him had the blank marble stare of a statue. Judith's dress was dry. Not a hair on her head had been ruffled by the wind. The storm hadn't touched his wife because she was beyond touching now. He ran toward her, even though he knew that she was beyond his touching too. Still he ran. The sky opened up once more, a curtain of water descended, separating him from his dead wife. He stumbled through the heavy beads of rain and into the house, stumbled from shadow-thronged room to shadow-thronged room, calling out to the ghost of the woman he had surrendered so much of his life to. And then he realized that maybe he was well on his way to becoming just another head casualty like his brother, Jack. Wonderful guy. Uh, not only great character, great character, great character development in your novels, but also, of course, the land of Saskatchewan. It's weather so important. 
So let's talk about a few of the characters, um, beginning with Ernie Sickert. <laughs> Who's everyone evil. says that. Yes, everyone says, says that name with a, a an up uh, raised eyebrow. Yeah, yes. Ernie Sickert, who's he's evil. He's a he's psychotic. He's a murderer. He's a confidence man, but richly drawn and very entertaining. Have you ever created a character like him, Guy? I think probably the cl the closest I've done before, which was a rehearsal. Uh, was I, I had a character in a good man called Michael Dunn who who shared some of the characteristics of of Ernie Sickert, but but Ernie Sickert is is kind of Michael Dunn carried to the nth degree, I suppose. Do you have a model for him? I mean, <laughs> um, okay, this is going to sound very, I suppose, very strange. As I was writing the character and and developing the contours of his personality. Um, it was about the time that uh, Mr. Trump got elected um, president of the United States. So Ernie Sickert shares some characteristics that I think of as Trumpian. Um, he's self-pitying, he's vain, um, he's arrogant. Um, he, he always assumes that, that he's right uh, and that the world is wrong. Uh, so in an odd way, uh, there is something, at least in my mind, I don't think perhaps anybody else would detect it, that's, that's Trump-like. Now, I'm not suggesting that, that Trump is a serial murderer. I'm just, I'm, I'm saying that in some ways, um, he, he gave something to Ernie Sick Sickert. Now, I don't think this was conscious on my part. I wasn't thinking I need to draw a, a Trump-like character, but I was so obsessed uh, with news reports of Trump uh, that I think by almost by process of osmosis that some of his characteristics congealed uh, with Ernie Sigurd. Wow. <laughs> That I wasn't expecting. <laughs> no, I, probably not, no. <laughs> well, he's, he's quite something, as I say, uh, richly drawn. So uh, you've already introduced us to Oliver Dill, or Dill as he's called throughout most of the novel. Uh, and then there's Vidalia Taggart, Jill's love, uh, Dill's love interest, the woman he falls in love with. Uh, I, I, as I think about it, thinking back to your other books, you have a special talent for drawing female characters, for creating female characters. And I don't know how to say this in any other way, but you must love women as a species, as a, <laughs> as, a, as, a, as a gender, what, what the hell do I call them? Yeah. I mean, one of the things is that when I was a child, um, I spent a lot of time with my grandmother, who, who was a remarkable woman and somewhat eccentric. Uh, and of course, I've, I've mentioned this on several occasions. I think of my mother as a proto-feminist. Uh, during the Second World War, she served in the Canadian Women's Army Corps. Uh, she was a sergeant major. Um, when she left that corps, like, like many women, she was expected to basically go back to the kitchen. That didn't sit very well with my mother, as, especially in that time. Uh, so Vidalia Taggart is intent on her independence. She's intent on thinking for herself. She's intent on, on making her own life. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why she's wary of Oliver Dill when, when he declares his love for her. She's had a relationship with a married man uh, to whom she was deeply attached. And she's not quite sure that she's ready for another attachment. There's another uh, Dill brother in this in this book, Jack, um, and uh, who has a lot of Bible quoting and theological reflection in his mind. He's a victim of PTSD. He was a World War One. He was in World War One as a soldier. Uh, so my question is: uh, Were you raised in the church, or is this all research? Um, okay, I, I was a very strange child. Uh, my 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 mother was actually quite anti-church, which then 
actually made me interested in church. Um, I, I was a Bible reader at a very young age. Uh, and I've always carried on, I can only describe it in one way, a flirtation with Christianity. Um, if I'm a believer, I'm not quite sure what sort of believer I am. Um, years ago, I said that, that um, I wouldn't claim that I was a Christian because I didn't want to, to give offense to Christians. Uh, but in, especially in my, my early, throughout my 20s, I spent a lot of time reading people like Soren Kierkegaard, Simon Weil, um, even Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who I had a, a fascination with him, the, the, the sort of highly principled martyr to, to, to Hitler, uh, was involved in, in one of the plots to, to assassinate hit, Hitler. Now, on one level, I take religion very seriously. Um, and, and it's, not, it's not given much due, I don't think, in contemporary fiction. Though I think of Marilyn Robinson, who's, who's a, a, you know, a very committed uh, Christian, and, and that's central to a great deal of her art and thinking. Um, now, Jack Dill has, has created his own theology out of, out of a, his trauma. And his theology is that he wants heaven and earth to be reconciled so that there's no separation between heaven and earth. In some ways, they commingle in a perfect existence. It's a very strange notion, and, and it's enacted in very strange ways, but it's his way of dealing with the world. Uh, and I think it's his way of dealing with the trauma inflicted on him by the Second World War. By the First World War. Or, I mean, sorry, exactly, I'm sorry, the, 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 the First World War. Um, so he's eccentric. Um, and his, his theology is strange. But when you look at it, it, it has, I would argue, it has some of the, the mystical qualities of the great Christian mystics. Um, who often are far more unorthodox than they are orthodox. And in fact, it plays into the plot near the end, right? Uh, he has visions, and uh, we won't give away what it is, but it does, it, it is important. It's not just that he's a strange character. Yeah, I mean, I, I feel great, I feel a great affection uh, as, as the writer of a character, I feel a great affection. For, for Jack, because there's a kind of innocence uh, about him, despite the horrific things that he did in the First World War. Um, he, he has a, what I would call a kind of almost sweet, blithe nature to him um, that uh, uh, infuriates his, his brother, who, who thinks of himself as Jack's caretaker. Uh, but I, I, I've got a lot of affection for that character. I just want to mention to our audience that um, we will we will have leave some time at the end for questions and answers, uh, your questions and guys' answers. Uh, so if you uh, if you have any, put them in the Q and A section that uh, Ara mentioned when we when we began. So, guy, this is historical fiction, but you're writing it with a 21st century sensibility for 21st century readers. So my question is. Do you write about the past in order to inform the present? Yeah, I think that all historical f fiction has some connection with the present. It, it, it can't avoid that uh, because we, as living in the contemporary world, we are actually immersed in contemporary questions. So one of the things that I think that historical fiction does is that it offers warnings um, to the present in, in a certain way. And, and but by, by that, I mean, um, often if you read history, and I did study history at the university, history is an analytic discipline that explains how something happened. That is, how did we get to the point 
where we are now. Okay. That may suggest to many people that, that, that those people in the past were in some ways kind of dim. They were kind of stupid. They couldn't see what was happening. I think what historical fiction does reminds us that the people in the past were as bewildered, as unable to predict the future as we are today. Um, we are confronting all sorts of things and we don't know what the outcome is going to be. So when Neville Ch Chamberlain declared peace in our time, in retrospect, we can say of Neville Chamberlain, you fool, how, how could you believe that? But millions of people believed that. He was cheered when he came back to, to London, to England. Absolutely, he was applauded, he was a hero. Right. Um, and, and if historical is, is, if historical is, fiction is written as, as, as if the writer of it is inhabiting the minds of the characters at that period, I think that the very best historical fiction doesn't condescend to those people, right? It treats them the same way that contemporary fiction treats contemporary characters. Um, so, I mean, that's one of the, the I, I think, one of the things that, that historical fiction can do for us. The other thing that, that maybe not so much on the surface this novel engages with is something that's concerned me for almost 10 years and that's the rise of the radical right. So there's a character in this novel, Dove Schechter, who volunteers for the Mackenzie Papineau um, battalion to go and fight in Spain. People in the 1930s were, conf were confronting a, a, a great upsurge of the radical right. And, and they, they, had to, they had to make decisions about how they were going to act in the face of it. Some people gladly, gladly decided that this was the answer for them for the future. Other people, as, as often happens, didn't pay very much attention to what was going on, and other people were, were terrified about what's going on. At this moment, looking, for instance, in, in Europe and North America and South America and virtually all over the world, I think we see the beginnings of, of, of a real upsurge in the radical right. And when I'm saying radical right, I'm not talking about conservatism. I'm, I'm talking about a right wing attitude that's linked to, to violence, that's often linked to racism and that's anti-democratic. So in some ways, because this has been lurking in my mind for some time, it was one of the reasons that, that the novel actually opens with the great confrontation with the radical right, uh, which was the Second World War. Um, and in 1972, if someone had said to me, communism will be dead, the Iron Curtain will fall, I would have said, you're crazy. You know, this, this monolith is, is here for a long time. I would have said that they were crazier if they had, would have said to me that fascism would have a revival. I would have thought that, that Hitler, the Holocaust, um, all of that would have discredited a kind of fascist ideology forever. But here in the United States and in Europe and all sorts of other pl places, people are marching with swastikas on their arms. Um, I, didn't, I didn't think that that would happen. What about Canada? Well, you know, it's in a sense, and I, 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 you know, I, I don't want to, uh, how would I put this? Where the United States goes, we often follow. I think that we probably have, um, we may be less prone to accepting uh, radical right ideology than the United States because we have a history of social democratic parties. Um, 
um, you know, centrist um, liberal parties, our politics hasn't become as polarized as it has in the United States, but um, things like anti-vaccination movements, um, the growing gulf between urban and rural voters, uh, there, 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 are, there are rifts uh, present in this society and, and that troubles me. Um, I, I don't want to suggest that we're in the state the world was in 1939, but what I do want to suggest is that we have to think very carefully about how we, how we deal with manifestations of violence and how we, how we deal with, with a, poli a politics of polarization. Uh, because politics of polarization, as it did in Europe, uh, drive citizens of, of a single country into becoming enemies. And, and, and when that happens, when dialogue stops, then democracy's in very great danger. I, should, I, sound, very, I sound very preachy at this moment. I have to apologize for that. No, no, I, I, I asked the question about Canada. And yeah. I want to pick up on this urban-rural split in this country. You and I are both from rural prairies. I'm right. from a small town, Altona, Manitoba. You're from Esterhazy, Saskatchewan. Yet we both have lived in cities. You lived in Saskatoon. And, and um, while I live outside of Kingston, I'm still very much involved in cities. So what, how does that play out? And what can we do to bring the city and the country and the rural, and rural parts together? I think one of the things that, that's necessary to happen is for our politics to, to realize um, that, there, that, that a rift has occurred. And, and part of that risk, rift that's occurred is the change of economies, which have made less feasible the sorts of occupations that rural people could rely on. At least in the West, farms have become huge. Um, you know, there are thousands and thousands of acres and small farmers have been pushed out. So what do these fall, small farmers do? I mean, many of them don't have the kind of education uh, that, that enables them to get good paying jobs. Um, there, there is a feeling, I think, that, that um, often urban politics um, may get distracted uh, by, by things that are not, not important to what I would call the dispossessed. I mean, one of the things I think back on is FDR. He built a huge alliance between blacks, poor white farmers, labor, uh, even, even certain elites by, by focusing on questions that were very important to them. The same thing I think is necessary for politicians now is actually to focus on things like economic issues, to focus on, 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 on matters that concern people who are struggling to, to make a living. I think that would do something. Um, and one of the things is that uh, I think that both sides actually have to realize that, that um, demonizing the other side uh, only creates problems. If urban people think that rural people are nothing but rednecks, right? Um, that they're kind of stupid hicks that don't know what's going on. And people in, in rural areas think of people who live in cities as being elites uh, who look down on people in rural areas. Uh, that doesn't that doesn't mend. That doesn't mend the problems. Um, yeah. it, I think we need an attitudinal change on the part of our politics. Um, uh, I unfortunately I don't, I don't 
see much of that happening because politicians are increasingly using wedge issues um, that they're aiming, they're aiming for a certain voter and they know that if they get, if they get just enough of the vote, they can form a government. When I think that they should be thinking about like how big an umbrella can, can, we, can we create and how many people can, can, can we attract and, 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 and actually help? Um, one of the things about politics is, is that maybe I'm being idealistic. I mean, po politics have always been about power, right? And it's always been about getting, getting elected. Um, but I think there, I can remember a time when I think that there was a larger measure of idealism in politics. Now, this just might be an old fart thinking that things were better, you know, way back then. I'm willing to grant that. Uh, but I can think of a number of politicians of all political stripes who seem to me what I would call dedicated public servants. Yeah. I mentioned earlier that the prairie landscape is such a, a key part of your books and this book, the weather, a huge rainstorm at the beginning, a big snowstorm near the end, all of which propelled the story. And I, would just, I want to read a short example for our, if you don't mind, for our audience, um, because this is one of the things that, that always draws me to your books. Now every afternoon, they went on a long walk over his farm, massive cumulus clouds foaming in the sky that shone like polished turquoise. The quality of this late sunlight intensified the color of ordinary things that usually didn't demand a second look. Lion tawny, bristling grass, pencil thin red willow glowing like banked coals, clusters of withered choke cherries smoking with purple black fire. I envy that last line, <laughs> that clusters of withered choke cherries smoking with purple black fire, which is a, you know, an image of, of the prairie landscape, choke cherries for sure. You obviously believe that this landscape is stunningly beautiful, don't you? Uh, yes. <laughs> I mean, I, I once wrote, you know, wrote, wrote a, a, a line about, about people who drove quickly through the prairies to get to the mountains in BC. Yeah. And they passed through the prairies deploring the condition of the washrooms as they, <laughs> as they sped on to BC. But, you know, it, it's a varied landscape. You know, the further you get up north, the more, there are plenty of lakes, there are plenty of trees. Uh, the Coppell Valley, which I grew up um, uh, very close to, I think is a very beautiful place. I lived in southwest Saskatchewan, um, comparatively close to the Cypress Hills. But even the flatness of the prairies, if you walk it and you actually pay attention to what you're looking at, in, in my books, it's, it's stunningly beautiful. And nobody gets the kind of skies we get, particularly in this month in September. There's there's no <clears throat> sky like a you know a, a September sky. So obviously I'm a booster. <laughs> I'm a fan of the landscape. The other thing is because I've spent virtually all of my life uh, there, I don't consciously write landscape. I don't say to myself, now sit down and write a patch of landscape. You know, no more than a writer in New York or Toronto would say, okay, it's time to give you a block of the Bronx <laughs> or Young Street or, or anything else. Uh, it's a setting, but it's also for me um, a reflection, at least in some measure, of, of the psychology of the place. So when Oliver Dill is walking his land, uh, he, he, he feels about his land, about the way that somebody who loves their city feels about their city. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of the definition of a provincial. I was born here. I was educated here. I've only lived a very short time outside the province. Um, so I'm kind of steeped in it. Um, I'm, I suspect I'm here for the duration no matter how long or short it is. Yeah. 
Is that a conscious choice to stay? I mean, you probably, you could have left. You taught in Ottawa, I think for a year or two yeah. or so. Um, was it a conscious choice to stay? I think one of the things that, that um, I'm easily distracted. And one of the, I had a feeling that if I really lived in a big urban center, uh, I would get distracted from what I thought of as my job. The, the other thing is, is that I had a feeling that, that early memories, childhood memories, or the memories of, of, of youth uh, are among the most powerful. And I was afraid of moving away uh, from the province and then writing it as a relic or a museum piece. Um, I mean, some of my work, even though I've gone into historical novels, but uh, the short stories are contemporary. And I, I think in the time from my first short story collection, which was contemporary, contemporary meaning the late 70s and early 80s up until my latest collection, actually in some ways have, have charted the changes in the province, which I don't think I would have been able to do if I had moved away or I shouldn't say think I could, could do, I wouldn't have been able to do. You always have such memorable titles uh, of your novels. And I, when, I, when I got this book, uh, August into Winter, I just thought, what a fabulous title. Did you, did you come up with that? Yes, <laughs> I don't always I don't always win with my publisher or my agent when it comes into into titles. Uh, but I did come up with this and I mentioned it to a painter friend of mine and he said, I want that title for my next show. So <laughs> <laughs> wow. that's a wonderful title. It, it's I mean, it, the three words, it, it it sets the scene without setting the date, of course, but uh, we know how dramatic that this period of time is. And we've just come through August and now almost finished September. Each uh, chapter of your book, Guy, has a quote from the Winnipeg Evening Tribune uh, in it, right around the date that we're, uh, that, that the date that, that, that the story is, is in. Why did you decide to do that and how did you choose those? Um, first of all, it was kind of an organizational principle for me because I, I wanted the progress, the progress of the approach of war to be marked in the novel. So as the, as the novel developed, there would be this, this chapter heading that would kind of give you what the state of the world is at that moment. The other thing is, is that often the, the, the headings from the novel may reflect uh, some sort of echo in the chapter that's coming. So for instance, there is a, there's a section that deals with a German mystic um, who it, it being sort of reported that Hitler is afraid of and, and, and uh, that, that she may be bad news for, for, for Hitler because she may be able to separate the, the peasant Catholic classes from, from allegiance to Hitler. And then in the, the, the novel that fall, or I'm sorry, the, the chapter that follows, th there's this character Struthers May, uh, Mayfield who, whose who's, um, grandmother is a, uses the Bible as a, as a predictor, uh, the old, very old practice of letting the Bible fall open, put your finger on a passage and that, that will tell you what's happening. So right. I, I, I hoped, in, in each chapter heading uh, to, to remind the re reader that we're getting closer and closer to war and, and after war is declared that we're getting deeper and deeper into the situation, but also to, to have a, to color perhaps subconsciously for the reader what, what is going to happen in that chapter. Now that, that meant hours and hours and hours of searching through the newspaper for, for, the, for the passage that I thought was, was appropriate and that would resonate. You did that yourself. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I, when it comes to research, I never, 
I would never hire a research assistant because the small stuff that you stumble upon is also the most often the most important stuff. Um, and I'm not when I write a historical novel, I'm not the the kind of writer who has got very clear in his mind or her mind what I need. Right. So I don't go looking for what I feel I need. I just keep on reading widely in the period and then i think oh this this is something this is interesting this is this is something that i can do do something with maybe unexpected give a little bit of twist to that um so that's the way i work and, and that means that i would think that maybe 10 percent of my research or less ever appears in a novel um uh, the, most of it never makes makes it into a book that I'm writing. I think we should see if we have any questions from the audience, things that they're desperate to know that I haven't asked. So I do have one question here. This is from Julie, who says, can you tell us about the last years, 10 since your last novel? What were you working on? Has this novel occupied most of your writing space? Um. I did publish a collection of short stories in that period. And, and I have personal reasons for why it took me so long to do. I mean, one of the things is this, that my wife died almost 10 years ago. And um, I'd married very early. We'd been together for almost 40 years. She had always been my first reader. And in the, the sort of emotional collapse, I think that, that people go through in a situation like that, I wondered if I would ever write again. Then when I started writing again, I felt that I wasn't ready to take on a big project. So I wrote, I wrote short stories. This book took me long. I'm, I've always been a slow writer. This book took longer for me to write than other books which I'm starting to suspect now might have something to do with age. Um, you don't want to admit that. No, I don't want to admit that. Absolutely <laughs> not. Uh, I can't. I can't work as as long as I as I used to. Um, and I think what often happens with older artists of every kind, you become more meticulous. Uh, you're less willing to say. Uh, that's good enough. Um, or, um, yeah, you know, that, 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 that passes the bar. I think it's a, it's a whole group of things that, that, that made this book more difficult to write than other books. Uh, and I can't put my finger exactly on, on, what's the prime cause for it. Um, but those would be some of the reasons. I, why don't I follow up a little bit on that question of, on Julie's question, which is writing as an older person. You're what, 70 now, 70, yeah. 70 years old. Um, do you, are you, do you think you can continue writing? You said it's, you're, you're more, more slower as a, it's more, it comes more slowly now. Is it harder now? I think it's harder because when you're when you're younger, you have you know you have the excitement of doing the thing for the first time, uh, which gives you a kind of eagerness. There's a sort of thrill to it. And I'm not saying that there aren't pleasures in writing anymore, but there are different kinds of pleasures. I think I'm more consciously a craftsman now. Uh, and the second thing that I would uh, that I would say is that. One of the things I think that often happens to writers is that they begin striving to become simpler. Um, when, when I was a young writer, I was really enamored of the convoluted, uh, how would I put it, the convoluted metaphor or simile. Um, I, 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 I like to dress up my prose a lot, a lot, more than I do now. Um, and I, you know, I'm not comparing myself to Tolstoy, but this was one of the things that, that, that 
Tolstoy fastened on in his last years. And one of his great works, um, in my opinion, um, was a novel that he wrote, more like a novella that he wrote when, when he was an old man, and that was Haji Murad. Um, I think that older artists of every kind probably get a little bit more enamored with simplicity. I have a question here from Laura Lewis in our audience who says, do you have a favorite novel? I think she means a favorite novel of yours. And can you speak to what you love about your more favorite literary contributions? <laughs> this is, this is a, um, Sounds, sounds like one of those things that my mother always warned me about, like, don't toot your own horn. Um, I, I, I mean, I think- Go that, ahead, you're 70, go ahead. Yeah, well, I guess so. I don't have too much, too much tooting left, maybe. Um, I think that one of the things that, that okay, I think that, that uh, just like often in folkism, like, often the ugly child is, is the most loved. I really like a blackly comic novel that I wrote when I was very young called My Present Age uh, that most people didn't like when it came out. So in a sense, that's a favorite of mine. One of the things that, that I think that, that I would, if I were to, to sort of pat my, myself on the back, I would say one of the things is, is that I was always intent on being a Canadian writer. And by that, I mean, I wanted to write this country and I wanted to write my particular part of this country. I wanted to, Mordecai Richler had, had, had a phrase about getting right his place and time. I wanted to make some sort of contribution to that, to, 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 make, to make a record uh, of my place and my time. How well I've done it, I, I, it's not for me to say, but I would say that that, that was an achievement. Um, and I think that my three historical novels set in the West may have done something to, to show other people in Canada that things happen here and that the things that, that happen here actually often have national influence. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 I think what I call my rough trilogy of, uh, of uh, historical novels, uh, that and, and, and my ugly child, the, my, my black comic novel that was written in my 20s, that those would be the things that I would fasten on. The trilogy is now available as a one book, right? Right. What, and it's called something else. What, what is uh, the Frontier? The, I think it's called the Frontier Trilogy. It's, it's, Frontier. it's, available, it's available as an electronic book. It's just, a, it's a packaging thing, I think. Okay. Um, I don't think we have any other questions. So I have one more. What are you working on now? Right now, um, I'm actually considering collecting nonfiction that I've written over the years. And I'm attempting to write a very, a long, longish essay, perhaps 150 pages, um, that deals with the writer as public intellectual, uh, for which I'm doing a lot of reading and a lot of research and doing a lot of thinking about. I have novel ideas kicking around in the back of my head. Uh, I'm not sure if, if they'll, they'll make it to paper uh, or I should say now computer screen. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of in a hiatus at the moment aside from the, the, the collection of nonfiction. Okay. I wanna end, there's this wonderful toast in the novel, in your novel, August into Winter, Dill says to Vidalia, to the confusion of our enemies, <laughs> which I love. So I'm going to toast this novel and say to you, let's have a drink, virtual, unfortunately, Guy, and to say, to the confusion of our enemies, 
and thank you for a wonderful book. Well, th 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 thank you for your interview. It was very, very thoughtful, and and uh, uh, I really appreciate the 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 care and and attention that you paid. So thank you. It was it was lovely. Well, it's worth it, and I just want to say to all the people who are with us today, buy it. August into winter. It's a fabulous book. Thanks, Guy. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to Eric Friesen and Guy Vanderhaeg for this wonderful conversation this afternoon. Um, I would like to congratulate Sharon Bull, who has won a copy of Autumn into Winter. And as Eric says, if you didn't ha win a copy, they are available for sale at our official bookseller, Novel Idea. Um, if you're outside of this area, we encourage you to find your local independent bookseller and pick up a copy there. And I want to thank you so much for joining us and for supporting Kingston Writers Fest. And be sure to check out kingstonwritersfest.ca for the rest of our lineup. Um, and have a lovely